Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Confederation Club of Waterloo's 2021 Winter Webinar Series. Our goal is to bring Canadian digital politics to life. My name is Barb Shackleton, and I'm Confederation Club Director of Marketing and your host today uh, for our webinar with Mike Harris, MP of Kitchener, Conestoga. And he'll be speaking on a very interesting topic and one near and dear to my heart, digital government in Ontario's action plan to reduce red tape and adapt to the 21st century. A few items of interest to mention before we dive in. Uh, we are recording this webinar, so you'll be able to share it and listen to it on our website at confederationclub.ca. And we also plan to poll the audience, and we encourage you to participate. Your responses are completely anonymous, and we do appreciate your input. If you wish to submit a question, pop it into the Q&A box, and Stephen Cage, our Speakers Committee Chair, will be our Q&A moderator and will be, uh, we'll attempt to get to your question um, as time allows. So please ensure that your questions are appropriate. All right, let's dive in. For those of you who may or may not be uh, familiar with the Confederation Club, just a little bit of background about our organization. The Confederation Club of Waterloo was founded in 1976 with Joe Clark as our first speaker about a month before he became party leader. Our speakers have included past Conservative and Progressive Conservative Prime Ministers, Brian Mulroney, Kim Campbell, and Stephen Harper. Our impressive speakers list is available uh, at our website, uh, confederationclub.ca, and it lists all of our speakers for the past 45 years. Looking to the future, we look forward to continuing the tradition of hosting Conservative Prime Ministers, whether digital or perhaps in person, if circumstances allow. to provide a bit of background and context uh, for the Waterloo region. Uh, we definitely punch above our weight and as Canada's high-tech capital, we are home to Google's Canadian engineering headquarters and home to, uh, home to homegrown world-class companies that include Shopify, Applyboard, Intellijoint Surgical, Bidgerd, and my own amazing employer, Igloo Software, the world's top intranet. We boast a spectacular array of advanced manufacturing giants that include Toyota, Christie Digital, and HES automation tooling systems. Our wonderful Mennonite community entrenches a strong work ethic and community spirit second to none. And our world famous St. Jacob's Market is a great destination that hopefully we'll all be able to return to soon. Without further ado, I would like to now ask Jerry Zhang, president of Confederation Club to formally introduce our guest speaker. Jerry, take it away. Okay, uh, <clears throat> thank you, Barb. Uh, I'd like to welcome all the audience online. Uh, thank you for uh, participating uh, in our webinar uh, and thank you for your continuous uh, support. Uh, our guest speaker tonight is Mike Harris. Uh, so Mike is a proud Waterloo Region resident, uh, former small business owner and a, fa a father of five children. I don't know, how do you handle that? <laughs> he represents uh, our diverse, diverse uh, riding of Kitchener Conestoga, which encompasses uh, three of the water region's uh, rural uh, township, Wellmont, uh, Wellesley, uh, Woolwich, as well as the south uh, western portion of Kitchener. So in addition to being a strong advocate for rural and urban uh, priorities at Queens Park, uh, Mike serves as the parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. So joining on his extensive uh, private sector experience, uh, Mike continues to promote dynamic opportunities for Waterloo uh, region. So it's our great honor, uh, Mike, uh, on behalf of the Confederation Club, we welcome you uh, to uh, our webinar series. It's absolutely our honor to have you uh, to speak to our audience tonight. Uh, Mike, so uh, take it away, you have the floor. Well, that's great. Thank you so much, uh, Jerry, and I hope uh... You can all hear me here as I move a bunch of things around on my screen, but give me a thumbs up, Jerry, if we're all good. Yes, you're, you're, you're good, Perfect. Mike. Excellent. Yeah. So uh, yeah, listen, it's, it's great to be here tonight. And, and of course, thank you, Jerry, for uh, the, the glowing introduction, really appreciate it. And uh, of course, to the members uh, of the Confederation Club for inviting me here uh, to present today. Um, I believe this is uh, my second official opportunity uh, to address your membership and guests. 
And I truly appreciate the work your club does to provide uh, information, encourage dialogue in Waterloo Region, particularly during these unprecedented times. So it's great that you're still carrying on the tradition after all these years of, of, of getting the word out there and giving us as, as conservatives a, uh, a forum to, to, dis to discuss things. And uh, tonight, um, we're not gonna discuss COVID-19 directly. I think it's important uh, that we all take a little bit of a, a mental break from some of the, the current events that are going on. But I do, however, want to express my uh, relief that businesses, uh, especially our small retail businesses are able to open uh, their doors once again. And that Jerry, of course, that kids are back to school. And I can tell you, it's been, uh, it's been an interesting time over the last couple of months in the Harris household with, with five kids. And they're, they're all in school ranging from, uh, from JK all the way up to uh, our, our oldest son is, is 14 and uh, at KCI downtown, so high school. So we're, we cover all the gambit. Um, so really happy to see them back in school. But you know, the, the topic I wanna to discuss tonight, uh, which is digital government uh, or really the lack thereof in this province, um, you know, it was not a unique problem caused by the current pandemic, uh, but it did underline our shortcomings and pushed us uh, to find solutions to the problems that we've seen uh, every day over the last, uh, going on a year now. Um, and I'm going to focus a little bit more on the latter tonight and discuss how the current progressive conservative government is digitally transforming the public sector to better serve the people of Ontario. I think as we all know, as, as Barb mentioned, and I've had a chance to, uh, to tour through uh, the Igloo headquarters, downtown Kitchener, they do a fantastic job. Um, you know, we know that Waterloo Region is a provincial and national leader in innovation, uh, particularly when we're talking about high tech uh, and digital sectors of the economy. Almost every week I meet with a new company or entrepreneur that is looking for information and support from the Ontario government. And this includes looking to the province for an opportunity to sell, or even test and partner um, to, to test homegrown, homegrown products. But the reality is for most of these startups and scale-ups though, uh, you know, that nine times out of 10, this product would improve how the state provides service, whether uh, it would be more cost efficient or enhance accessibility for Ontarians. Their government relies on tried and tested methods that are unfortunately better suited for the previous century. I know this struggle firsthand because after opening my small business and before putting my name forward for provincial office, I worked for a company called Route One. Uh, there I led business development of their MobiKey product, which was a device that would allow any individual to connect securely from any other device like a laptop uh, or a tablet remotely back to their office from virtually anywhere in the world as long as you had an internet signal. And I think you know, when we look at at what, what that meant uh, three or four years ago um, and, and all of the short sightedness that the government had then, gosh, would it ever have come in handy for them now? And I'll tell you, like many other companies in this province, our biggest clients were not the federal, provincial or municipal governments in this country, but the American Pentagon and the water United States government is where we found our most success. And, and to be quite frank, pounding my head on a desk was more productive than trying to crack the nut of procurement within this country, which is really unfortunate. While at Route One, uh, I was able, while, while we're at One would be able to navigate a lot of these ongoing realities, many others are struggling to break through and are more than ready to partner with their own government. And I propose that beyond just providing these companies a domestic market to scale up, this partnership would include innovations that would lead to better and more people-focused government here in Ontario. And I'm happy to share that today, Ontario is starting to break down barriers with digital initiatives that will cut red tape and finally bring us into the 21st century. Under Premier Ford and Finance Minister and President of the Treasury Board, Peter Bethlen Falvey, the province has launched Ontario Onwards, Ontario's COVID-19 action plan for a people-focused government. And at this moment, this includes more than 30 projects that will improve the way people and businesses interact with government by offering access to more services online. These projects will focus on key themes, including making public sector services and service delivery modern and customer-focused, making the public sector digital and more data-driven and putting data at the center of government decision-making. 
And of course, increasing efficiency, effectiveness, effectiveness, and the speed of government operations and decisions. And I know sometimes that those can be as slow as molasses for everybody or anybody that's on the call tonight that has had to uh, deal with whether it be the provincial, uh, federal, or even municipal governments. A project that has grabbed headlines recently is our plan to introduce a digital ID. The Ontario government is launching an online consultation to seek the input uh, of the pro on the province's plan to introduce a digital ID by the end of 2021. Through the digital ID program, people and businesses in Ontario will be able to securely and conveniently prove their identity online. This will save people time and money and offer a more convenient access to government and private sector services. This could affect the lives of Ontarians in many, many ways. For example, a parent could more easily access their children's immunization records and share them online with their school. A small business owner could reduce red tape by registering for licenses and permits or opening new accounts online. I like this one. A farmer could register a farm vehicle online without traveling to government offices to prove their personal identity. And a senior could check into a doctor's appointment and securely share health information with caregivers and healthcare providers. A digital ID would also support COVID-19 or future pandemic safety product protocols by limiting unnecessary in-person contact to help stop the spread of any potential virus. And these are just a few examples of how individuals and businesses could benefit from a digital ID. Overall, it's estimated its use could increase efficiency and result in a potential $4.5 billion of added value to the small and medium sized enterprise sectors, and that Ontario stands to gain anywhere between eight and $25 billion in economic value over time. Uh, Mike. Oh, yeah. Sorry, your, your uh, sound is coming in and out a fair bit. I'm oh, not no. sure that's something you can adjust. Oh, it's very, very possible. Let me get a little uh, closer to the old microphone here. Excellent. Okay, thanks. How's that? Better? That should be better. Thanks. Awesome. Very good. Sorry, the heat just kicked on here. So that's probably what you're hearing. Um, so so listen, you know, al although some might think it's contrary uh, to, popu uh, to popular belief, but a digital ID could also very well uh, reduce identity fraud. And a recent analysis of 335 government services found that approximately 70% of those services required some level of identity verification. And most of the physical cards and documents used to prove identity today, whether that be a driver's license, a health card, et cetera, were not designed for online use, which leads to the risk of identity fraud. Another suite of projects involves modernizing our justice system. Traditionally, this system had relied heavily on paper to move cases forward. By digitally connecting police, crown attorneys, courts, and corrections partners, we have begun to enable a real-time flow of data, documents, and media so that the right information is in the right hands faster. And this includes a new digital evidence management program. This will provide police services with access to cloud-based technology to allow evidence, once physically handled, to be shared securely amongst justice sector partners. For example, it will provide capacity to capture, store, manage and share large audio and video files without the need of USBs or DVDs. This includes evidence recorded and shared through bystander cell phones, 911 audio, interview room cameras, dash cams, and body worn cameras, as well as photographs. It would also allow a police service to request help from the public, enabling the public to upload evidence directly to the system in relation to an investigation while remaining completely anonymous. Ultimately, by eliminating the need for sharing and transporting evidence in person, police officers will spend less time carrying out administrative work and more time on what matters most in protecting our communities. And I can tell you, I've seen this firsthand when I've been out doing ride along, uh, ride alongs with our Waterloo Region Police Services officers. We spent just as much time either waiting at the hospital or filling out paperwork as we did out on the street. But not only that, we're also making the judicial, uh, judicial system more accessible. On Tuesday, I had a, an opportunity to question the Attorney General, 
Doug Downey uh, during question period on our proposed Accelerating Access to Justice Act. This act includes permanently allowing the virtual witnessing of wills and powers of attorney to save people time and money uh, of traveling to access these, person, uh, these services in person. These digital innovations make common sense, cut red tape, and create a more people-centered government. This was also the goal of my first private member's bill, centered on dealer, uh, digital dealer registration. The Cutting Red Tape for Motor Vehicle Dealers Act, or better known as Bill 50, which passed second reading in November 2018 and adopted in government le uh, legislation in May 2019, sought to amend the Highway Traffic Act to enable certain motor ve vehicle dealers to apply for permits, license plates, sticker validations, and use vehicle information packages electronically online. I think most of us have had an experience where we've gone to a car, car dealership and we've had to wait a couple days from the time we purchased it uh, to actually being able to drive it, plate it off the lot. And this delay would usually be the result of a car dealer having to physically travel and wait in line for plates and stickers at a local service Ontario. Moving this process securely online and in line with neighboring jurisdictions like Quebec, New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island, New York State, Michigan and others will make motor vehicle dealerships one-stop shops, saving dealers and customers time and money. Although COVID-19 has postponed the pilot and rollout of this initiative, I look forward to seeing this common sense and 21st century approach implemented very soon. Beyond being the proud MPP for Kitchener Conestoga, I'm honored to be the parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Even in this ministry that manages Ontario's great outdoors, important modernization is underway to make government work for the people. For anglers and hunters, the Fish and Wildlife Licensing Service now includes licensing features that make it more convenient to buy your outdoors card, as well as fishing and hunting licenses online. This includes printing your tags at home or, uh, and online rather than heading down to a Service Ontario outlet or other government office. In a lot of cases in remote areas, this could mean up to a 30 minute or even one hour drive into town. For the technology buffs out there, we are also expanding our use of an advanced technology called LIDAR in forest management. This uses remote sensing capabilities to get an incredibly precise picture of forest volume. LIDAR is an exciting tool for forest managers. It stands for light detection and ranging and is a technique that uses laser light to sample the surface of the earth, producing highly accurate measurements. And you may be asking, well, why should I care? You know, to sum up, this technology will greatly improve the way we Ontario's total wood volume. And this increased accuracy will improve our forest management planning practices and decision, make, decision making abilities. Ontario can currently harvest right now roughly 30 million cubic meters per year sustainably. And right now, if you can believe this, we only utilize about one half of that amount, which is wasted economic potential for our province. And we've seen this happen time and time again, where we have a little bit, a liberal government will come into power and the first things to suffer are the forestry and mining industries and Northern Ontario. Forestry is an $18 billion industry in this province, which employs nearly 147,000 direct and indirect jobs. Doubling this industry through innovation would support needed economic growth, particularly, like I said, in rural and northern areas of this province with few other industries to rely on. While this is just one example from a single ministry, it is representative of a wider transformation in government. The Ministry of Transportation recently launched an expanded Ontario 511 app, which will allow drivers to keep track of snow plowing and road conditions in the winter, construction, collisions, and road closures year round, with the use of roughly 600 cameras across the province. There, uh, you know, many examples are being designed and coming online soon. And that this provincial government has committed, and this is a great one, and, and I think a lot of people on the call tonight are, are probably aware of this already, but the provincial government has committed 
$1 billion over the next 10 years to build out high-speed broadband internet to our rural and remote communities to ensure all Ontarians have access to digital government. And we actually just had a great call with uh, SWIFT, which is the Southwest uh, Fiber Integration Network, who's doing a lot of great work around here. And I think we've actually got roughly about 12 RFPs that have gone out. Uh, and we've actually seen uh, work start on a lot of those here within Waterloo Region. So listen, I'd, I'd like to conclude just by saying there's a lot more that we can do. We inherited a government that was stuck not only in the 20th century, but also buried under red tape and red ink. Our 2018 promise to restore fiscal accountability and transparency for the people of Ontario is at the heart of these digital initiatives. I look forward to keeping this promise and continuing to grow our progress. Just wanted to say thank you to everybody that's on the call here today. And uh, Jerry, I, I think we wanna do a little Q&A, so, so happy to do that, or, or Stephen or whoever uh, is gonna facilitate it. Thank you so much. Oh. There we are. Good. Uh, well, thank you, Mike, for your excellent presentation. Uh, we're now moving to the question and answer portion of the webinar. And a number of club members and other attendees have pre-submitted questions. Any attendee who has a question for Mike should enter it on the question and answer function, the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. But before we start, I'd like to recognize uh, the attendance of Kitchener Mayor Barry Verbanovic. Welcome, Mayor. Uh, Mike, if you're ready, we'll start with the first question. How will the government measure the success of the digital measures? Yeah, that's that's a great question. And, and awfully, that kind of thing, um, you know, to quantify can be, can be pretty tough. But I think when we when we go out and we, we survey people and we find out what's going on, um, just being able to, to get feedback um, from the kind of the community at large, I think, is going to be really important to see what's working, um, you know, what's not, what needs to be tweaked. Uh, you know, there's gonna be lots of community consultation um, as these things start to roll out. And I think one thing too, to, to remember obviously is that not everybody is able to, um, you know, have an online presence maybe as much as they'd like to be. So also still being able to continue um, these services in, in a brick and mortar fashion, whether that be at Service Ontario or, or any of the other government ministry offices will be pretty important too. But I think that number one piece is just going to be the, the feedback that we get from people and, and finding out, like I said, what, what can be tweaked, what we can do better, uh, and, and just continually trying to build off that and move forward. Excellent. Um, next question is online. Is there a single place where we can go to get a look at the full list of the 30 projects you referenced? Yeah, there's a, there's been a, a few press releases and different things that have come out. Um, the Ontario Newsroom website, uh, you'd have to probably uh, use the search feature there or, or scroll back a little ways because we did announce these um, back uh, back in, in last year. It was, I think, in the, 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 maybe the late fall, just before Christmas, when a lot of this started to get rolled out. Um, I'm not sure who asked the question, but we could also just sort of have our office follow up direct with some more of that information, Stephen, if, you're, uh, if you'd like. Okay, I'm sure they'll do that. Uh, next question is from, uh, well, the president of the Waterloo PC riding, Jean Demira. Are the new digital initiatives tied to ensuring that the government of Ontario's services are modernized, similar to other sectors, like financial services, telecom, et cetera? Well, and I think that's when we compare ourselves to, um, to, the, to the private sector, we just, we lag behind, um, you know, we're talking decades with a lot of this stuff. And um, we're using legacy systems, systems that are, are, you know, older than maybe some of the people on the call. Actually, I'm going to be 36 tomorrow, so probably older than me. Happy birthday. <laughs> Thanks. Um, but uh, yeah, listen, we, we need to be able to better integrate with, with the private sector. We need to be able to, um, it, people expect to be able to, you know, have uh, modern, initiatives coming from their government. And, and I think when you when you look at everything else that's going on in the world right now, when it comes to, um, you know, the ease of access of information and how how easily you can get things back and forth, uh, we really need to draw on on what we're seeing from other um, other sectors. Uh, FinTech is a great example, uh, because a lot of what they do is very safe, very secure, we need to obviously be able to do that as, as a government, because you know, the data that we're passing back and forth um, like I was saying, we need to be very careful that, that it. 
uh, perpetuate identity fraud and these types of things. So certainly a lot of things we can draw on from the private sector, definitely. Excellent. Uh, next question. Will the new digital initiatives provide support for Canadian digital ID solutions through creating partnerships with existing technology hubs like Waterloo's Communitech or Toronto's Mars programs? Yeah, I think they're they're going to be very crucial in, in what we do developing going forward. I know that um, that the, the the Treasury Board is is really driving a lot of this. Um, believe it or not, they're the ministry that signs checks. It's not the Ministry of Finance. Um, and, and they've got a great relationship here locally with Communitech. Obviously, uh, Ian Klugman and I, um, you know, we talk on a, a pretty regular basis. Um, I, I like to joke that I can actually lead the tours of Communitech now because um, I've been there so many times. Um, but uh, yeah, listen, we've also got the Accelerator Center um, here as well in, in the region, which does fantastic work. Um, maybe not quite with all the glitz and glamour that you would see from Communitech sometimes, but um, they've spawned off some some fantastic companies out of there as well. And I know from from me personally, you know, being here in Waterloo Region and, and knowing so many of these great companies, um, I'm always trying to advocate for them and, and bring them to the forefront. And, and we've had some great success working with local partners to get a lot of these initiatives off the ground. Excellent. Uh, next question online. What are the security programs for the one line systems, given that the I, maybe they meant online systems, given the CRA had a break in their systems? Yeah, so so listen, you know, we're in the development phase right now. A lot of these things, like I said, are out for consultation. We're, we're looking at other jurisdictions, what they have done, whether that be, you know, private sector entities or other governments around the world. Um, whatever we do has to be safe and secure. Um, you know, at the end of the day, if somebody really, really wants to get at something, there's always going to be, a, a, you know, an opportunity for them to do that. But we need to make sure we're doing everything we can to make things safe and secure. And, and I know that as we move through the consultations and, and speak, like I said, with other jurisdictions that we'll try and put the best practices in place to make sure that we don't have those kinds of issues. Excellent. For KW companies who are active in supporting digital tra transformation, how can the private sector get involved? Yeah, listen, I, I encourage you to reach out to our office, um, you know, myself directly. We're, we're a great conduit into getting a lot of these things um, into the various uh, folks that need to hear them. Um, there's, as I said, there's going to be some consultation uh, done over the next little while on this, the digital ID project. Uh, so we'll be able to go ahead and, and make comments and, and official submissions and through that as well. Um, you know, we're, we're looking at trying to create a lot more of a kind of a one window approach when it comes to how people can interact with government so that they don't have to go to two or three different, you know, ministries or um, uh, departments to try and get their voice heard. So there's a lot of good things that are coming down the pipe, but if, if you have any interesting ideas or um, you wanted to get anybody in touch with myself or my office, please, um, by all means, you can uh, share our information around and, and we're happy to chat with folks. Excellent. Uh, next question is from the nomination candidate for Kitchener Conestoga, Matt Bondi. No, oh, that Matt Bondi guy. That yeah, <laughs> working to be your uh, your uh, counterpart with uh, in Kitchener Conestoga riding. Uh, can MPP Harris please speak to how Waterloo Region is uniquely positioned to help lead in Ontario's digital transformation? Yeah, listen, you know when it Toronto likes to kind of put itself out there as as the main technology hub uh, here in in the province, and certainly. Um, you know, obviously has a big footprint within Canada, but I think we all know that, that that's not the case. Waterloo Region does it best. Um, we've got some of Waterloo, uh, some of the biggest technology companies in, in North America um, headquartered here. Um, you know, we really only play second fiddle to Silicon Valley and Matt, Matt might beg to differ a little bit on that one. I'm sure he likes to think we're, we're number one, but um, there's, there's such a great opportunity as, as we look at all of the different things that are happening, uh, especially with uh, the Connect the Corridor initiative and, and trying to get, um, you know, the two-way all-day go service between Kitchener and Toronto. Um, you know, we've increased that 50% over the last couple of years and we're, we're trying to move forward with, um, you know, all the different upgrades and different things that are happening. But it, an, an interesting piece with this, and, and a lot of people don't realize it, but as we had some of these conversations, there's actually as many people that commute into Waterloo Region every day that commute out of Waterloo Region to say, you know, places like the GTA or Hamilton, Burlington. Um, so, so there's there's a lot, I think, on that that connection piece. We need to be able to move people in and out um, of the city uh, cities in a much more efficient way. 
um, and, and really trying to um, you know, build up the brand of Waterloo Region. I think everybody here, um, you know, for me, I've been here, it'll be eight years this March. Um, you know, we have raised two more kids of our five here since, since we moved down here eight years ago and, and we love the area, but I think there's, there's something interesting, uh, for, for me personally coming from Northern Ontario, uh, where we're maybe a little bit more brash, bold and in your face. Waterloo Region often, you know, it's pretty modest down here. You know, we don't, you, we don't toot our own horn maybe as often as we should. And I think that's one thing, um, especially in, in, in the talks that I've had with some various businesses. And I know, Matt, we've talked about this with Communitech and your role there as well. Um, you know, we really, really, as, as, a, as a Waterloo Region collective, need to get out there uh, and sing the praises and, and kind of bang the drum uh, with the good things that are going on here. Excellent. Uh, next question. Are you interested as our MPP to be engaged with challenges with Ontario's laws, which can be enhanced to reduce red tape and go securely in a digital fashion or who should we reach out to? Yeah, like I said, like I, I'm, I'm happy to, to kind of be a conduit to filter some ideas into the government um, or at least point you in the right direction when it comes to a bit more of an official channel to do that. Um, so please, when, when you, know, you get a chance either tonight or, or tomorrow, um, if you want to send a, a note to our office, just say you were on the, the Confederation Club uh, webinar so that uh, we kind of flag it and we can, we can move it up the queue. We get a lot of emails uh, every day, so I'm sure you can imagine, but um, just put that in the subject line so that we can, we can pull it out. And I think actually I do have um, some office staff on the, the call here as well, so um, happy to do that. You could probably do a quick Google search, Google search um, and, and find our office info if you, if you don't already have it. So certainly happy to help where I can. Excellent. Um, you've sort of already answered this question. It's, it's similar to what you've already been asked, but what protections of privacy concerns will there be for digital ID? Too much information going to Big Brother. <laughs> hey, that's, listen, it's a fair question. And, and I think people are always a little bit leery. Um, and it, this doesn't mean that you have to take part in this program. It, it'll be something that is you know, optional and available to you if you want to. Of course, you know, all the encryption methods, you know, all the coding, everything that gets done um, you know, has to follow personal protection laws that we have here in, in Canada with, with information privacy rights. Um, obviously, the, the privacy commissioner will be, uh, I, I think, very interested in what we're doing and making sure that, you know, we're following those rules. Um, but listen, we're not out here to get you. We're out here to make it easier for you to take advantage of, of government services. And, you know, one of the things that, that we campaigned on was reducing red tape. And making it making it easier for people to access government services, I think, is a is a huge piece of that. And and moving us every time I'm out, I always hear about how it's so hard to do business um, with the Ontario government. Uh, it, it's just a, a fact of life, and we we really want to change that. And we will really want to be able to promote a lot of our homegrown businesses to be able to partner with us and and deliver a lot of these services. Excellent. Um, so I've, I've done all the questions related to your, your presentation. So now we're going uh, off the off topic, but well, we're going okay. Come this up. is good. I like this. <laughs> okay. I think. Um, I think. <laughs> I am wondering what is your position regarding carbon tax? The tax break given to the taxpayers at tax time is not going to be anywhere near the cost increase to the consumer. And heavily a federal question, but still. Balance. Yeah, you know, you know what? Listen, I, I, I am not, I am not a favor, uh, in favor, uh, you know, of the carbon tax. I think there's, there's a lot better ways that we can work, and, and we have done this uh, here in Ontario. I can't obviously speak for the federal Liberals, but um, th there's ways that you can work with, with you know, some of the larger, um, you know, larger polluters to, to actually go out there and, um, you know help them modernize very similar actually to kind of the conversation that we're having with with technology um, and and government it works the same way um, with uh, with with private business too and and you know manufacturing and a lot of different things we were we, we do here in Ontario uh, working with them to to show them that there's often better ways to do things and you know where they can invest in other jurisdictions that they can look to and we've actually just done some really great stuff in regards to recycling and packaging um, it, you know, instead of putting taxes and all kinds of different things on, on, you know, what's going on with, with plastic materials, you know, we're just making sure that, that companies are being responsible and are now actually going to have to, um, you know, kind of pay, pay their fair share, um, 
with with regards to packaging and recycling. So there's lots of great things that we can do work, you know, in collaboration, in partnership with the private sector. But putting a tax on everything that's going to hurt um, the consumer, it's just not the way to do it. Great. Um, next question is related to the pandemic. Uh, what were the reasons for closing the small businesses, yet allowing the big box stores to open and be very crowded? Yeah, this, this was a, a bit of a tough one. And, you know, I'm a, a little bit conflicted on this. The, the reason that, that as, as I understand it, is, it was, is to try and kind of limit the amount of stops you have to make out in your day. And, you know, if we, can, if we can have you go into one place that's a bit more of a one-stop shop, it's a lot better. Um, but, you know, I, I was advocating very strongly um, to get our small businesses open. Um, you know, it's really important for them. We've, we've seen so many people going through such hard times over the last little while. And um, especially here, like I'm in my office in Elmira right now. And I think I've had just about every business on the street stop by at some point and say, hey, Mike, like, what are we doing? What's going on? Can you provide us with any insight? And, um, you know, I was a, a former small business owner myself. And um, due to the uh, unforeseen circumstances, and I know if Mayor Barry's on here, he's heard this a couple of times, he might not like it, but the eye on construction on King Street um, in Uptown Waterloo uh, was really challenging for me um, with fences up and construction vehicles all over the place and the road closed. Um, I ended up having to close my business because I wasn't able to, to, to keep moving forward uh, with, with the kind of unforeseen factors that um, you know, we weren't necessarily expecting to be quite as severe. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm not trying to equate that to everything that's happening right now. It's obviously, you know, different times, but you know, I've, I've kind of been through this in a way, and I certainly understand what it's been like for, for a lot of people. And I'm really, like I said, kind of off the top here tonight. I'm really, really happy to see our businesses back open, um, really almost everywhere across the province at this point. Absolutely. Uh, question online. Do you agree with the task force, uh, task force report headed by lawyer Walid Solomon on Ontario stock markets in mandating diversity quotas for boards and executive management? and the emphasis on environmental, social, and governments uh, issues for the Toronto Stock Exchange listed companies? Well, you'll have to, for, you'll have to forgive me, but uh, this is the first time I've really uh, kind of had anybody ask questions about it. So I'm certainly not, uh, you know, completely in, in depth, but, um, you know, I'm a free market guy. I think that you should be able to, to kind of, you know, run your business and, and, you know, whether that you be in the markets or not, uh, the TSX or, or anything. Um, I think it's important for you to be able to do what's best for your company, make the choices that that are going to provide you with the best opportunity. And um, that's really without knowing too much more about it. That's really all I can probably say. That's fine. Uh, next question is on reforestation. Are we going to be planting trees to reduce the carbon footprint? Yeah, well, you know what? This is interesting because uh, I think it was going back almost two years ago now. Um, one of the things when we were talking about uh, government savings and, and reducing red tape was us, um, you know, canceling the 50 million tree program, uh, which had been put in place by the previous government and was set to expire, I think, last year. And they hadn't even in the in the almost 10 years that program had been in place, uh, they hadn't even achieved 50% of their goal, if you can believe that. The forestry industry every year, and I'm pretty sure this is the number, plants 68 million trees a year. Um, which is a year, which is quite substantial. Um, and also um, do quite a lot of um, the Ministry of Natural Resources takes part in this as well, but they actually do aerial um, seed drops uh, out of planes and helicopters where they'll, they'll fly over an area that's, that's already maybe been harvested or, um, you know, could be a little bit sparse due to, uh, you know, a natural uh, pest or maybe a forest fire, for example, um, and we'll actually go and, and spread seeds over those areas. So, um, if you've ever had a chance to, uh, to get up in a plane and fly up to Northern Ontario, it's pretty green up there. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're, certainly, uh, we're certainly not hurting for trees in that respect, but we're always planting trees. There's always private organizations that are out there planting trees. Um, and there's lots of rules and regulations that are in place in more urban areas, too, to protect trees um, and, and make sure that we're, we're able to, um, you know, kind of keep our carbon footprint down by by protecting what we already have in place in some of our more urban areas. Excellent. Uh, another question online. Are there any concerns with protecting Waterloo Region home affordability with the current overheated market and high demand coming from buyers from outside the local area? Yeah, listen, I just moved, uh, gosh, when was it back in April in the middle of the pandemic, which was a lot of fun. 
Um, and uh, the, the housing market is just wild right now. Um, and I think that the biggest thing, and this is one thing that I've been a big proponent of uh, over the last little while, is just trying to increase the supply. Um, it, you know, typical market data will show if, if you can increase the supply, um, then the demand comes down and, and you start to be able to see some more affordable pricing. Um, I think the, the average home in Waterloo region right now is, is going for somewhere in the neighborhood that this would be like, a, you know, single detached averages like over $600,000. Um, and at, at the moment right now, because there is such a short supply, um, there's, there's houses that are, um, you know, almost inflated by a hundred percent, um, which is pretty crazy. So certainly trying to see more new home starts, um, trying to see some more, uh, affordable and attainable housing. Uh, put up here, I think is, is really important. And I know in my riding specifically in the Kitchener portion um, down in Southwest Kitchener, sort of that, that um, like Fisher Hallman and Huron Drive, uh, there's, there's a couple pretty big subdivisions going up in there right now. So I think it'll be, it'll be really good. You know, now that we're kind of moving through, uh, hopefully we're going to see some numbers trending down um, as far as uh, pandemic goes, being able to get those, um, those new starts that didn't have the foundations in the ground already. Uh, we'll be allowed to continue and, and we'll be able to get some more supply into the market. I think it's crucial. Excellent. Okay, so we, we're actually on to our, our last question now. Over the years, the PC party has held every riding in Waterloo Region. What do you think needs to be done to win back the region ridings that are not currently held by the PC party? Well, that's, an, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, I think, uh, I, and, and you know what, we actually, we've got some candidates, I think, too, here um, on the call tonight. Obviously, Jerry, you know, ran federally in Waterloo in the last election, and um, it was great to see him do that. And, and anybody that puts their name on the ballot and takes the initiative to do that, um, you know, I, I've got the, the, the most utmost respect for, uh, because I've been around politics, uh, well, pretty much all of 36 years of my life, really. So, um I think there's a lot of factors uh, that that go into that. Obviously, the the demographics of uh, of the folks out here is changing. You know, going back to the last question, um, you know, when we were knocking on doors in a lot of the new subdivisions during the last election, um, you know, just kind of asking people, you know, where they're from, etc. Did you move, you know, in the region or where, where did you come from? A lot of people were from the GTA um, and were sort of priced out of out of that area and and had moved here. Um, you know, and I think that that from a political standpoint, and I don't want to get too political here, but, um, you know, that, that obviously changes the dynamic when you've got voters that, you know, might be typical liberal voters or different things like that. Sorry, I got the heat kicking back on here, so I'll try and get a little closer again, but um, it just changes the makeup of, of some of these ridings a little bit. And, and I think, um, you know, really, really focusing on a, uh, a message of prosperity, entrepreneurship, reducing red tape, um, you know, things that will spur on business. For example, you know, we lost 12,000 manufacturing jobs in Waterloo Region uh, under the, the previous government. A lot of those went overseas and down to the states um, just because of, of, of some of the policies that they, that they brought in. Um, but, but trying to, you know, really create a, uh, an opportunity for people to, um, you know, kind of live their life the way that they want to and, and make sure that they have a, a good career and a good job and a, you know, a safe community. I think for, for candidates uh, or, or, or the party to be, you know, promoting those types of things, I think that those are things that really resonate with people here in the region. Good. Well, thanks. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, I'm now going to pass you back to our host, Barbara. We'll now formally thank you for your presentation. Thanks. Very good. Thanks, thanks, Stephen. Yep. Thanks, Steve. On behalf of the Confederation Club, I'd like to thank you to from for uh, participating this evening and, and sharing with us the details around digital government. I look forward to uh, seeing those transformations. Uh, we definitely uh, appreciate you taking the time to contribute to bringing Canadian digital politics to life, folks. It looks like we're going to continue to be virtual. Uh, so we encourage you to go to confederationclub.ca to sign up for future webinars. And with that said, we do have our next webinar lined up for March 11th. We will have Vic, uh, Vic Fidelli, MPP from Nipissing, uh, joining us. Uh, we haven't de determined what the topic will be yet, but I'm sure it will be interesting. And don't forget when you exit tonight um, to answer the poll. As I mentioned, it is completely confid uh, confidential, so we won't share your information. We encourage you to um, share this information uh, when you do receive the, the recording and share it with your friends and family and invite them next month. We look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Thank you again and have a good night.
Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Good night.